thank you all for uh, turning out. And uh, I'd like to introduce Robert. We were really privileged to have him come all the way out to Scotterboro this evening. Um, I think you're going to find an extremely dynamic speaker. Certainly, that was the reason why I wanted him to come this morning. I heard, when I heard him speak, <laughs> I was very, uh, very moved. He's a writer and a journalist. He's written two books on the history of psychiatry and the current, the current model of treatment in psychiatric medicine. And I think he's uh, given a lot of credence through hard facts and figures about what many people have experienced either through the clinical work or through their own personal journey about the efficacy and the long-term effects of psychiatric medication. So without any further ado. Well, first of all, thanks for uh, having me up here. It's nice to be up here. I was hoping that it would be springtime when I came up here. <laughs> it doesn't seem like spring is coming this year. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about 45 minutes, and we'll have time for uh, question and answers. I think that'd be good. So this, the last book I wrote is a book called Anatomy of an Epidemic, and it actually came out about four years ago. And anatomy had really was meant to do this. We have this uh, paradigm of care that we really embrace with psychiatric drugs at the center of that care, and really ask this question. How, how, how is it playing out? Is it working for us as a society? Is it, does the data show that it's working for individuals? So in other words, are we lessening the burden of mental illness in our society? Are, people, are we helping people lead full lives or not? It's really the question. And so I think you can see it's a, a profound question for us given how pervasive psychiatry sort of enterprise has come in, in, in the United States. Today. So as a the, the, the starting point for this story is this, is that there is a narrative out there uh, in the society as a whole which would answer that, qu th that question this way. Of course it's working out. It's working out great. And that narrative that, that drives our care goes like this. That in 1955, a drug called Thorazine arrives in asylum medicine, and that kicks off a great psychopharmacological revolution, a great advance in care. And that drug is remembered today as the first antipsychotic. Can you hear those words, antipsychotic? It's like it's a, a specific antidote to psychosis. Like an antibiotic is a specific antidote to a bacterial illness. And then in the story, and you, you'll hear, for example, in the history of psychiatry, written by a, a historian at the University of Toronto, he says, the arrival of Thorazine in, as in asylum medicine was as profound a leap forward as the arrival of penicillin in infectious medicine. Now that comparison is telling you there's been few things as important as the arrival of penicillin in infectious medicine. So if the arrival of Thorazine is likened to that, that is telling you this extraordinary leap forward, okay? And then we also get antidepressants, we get anti-anxiety agents, and so, and, and so we suddenly have a lot of drugs that are seen as antidotes to specific disorders. Now if you go forward with this narrative progress, it goes like this. In 1987, Prozac arrives in, in, on the market, and this is the first of the second generation um, psychiatric drugs, said to be safer and, and better than the first. And it's, it's with the arrival of Prozac that we really embrace the use of these drugs. So for example, as a society, we spent about $800 million on psychiatric drugs in 1987. Any guess of what we spent in, say, 2010 as a society? How much? What did I hear? Billions. A billion? Billions. Any other? Billions. How many billions? Three. 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 <coughs> Any other guesses? <laughs> Okay, 80 is a little high, but it's 40. <laughs> so it's in 2010. So that's a 50-fold increase. So it tells us like how dramatically our use of psychiatric <coughs> medications has increased. And again, as part of this story of progress, we're told that these drugs fix chemical imbalances in the brain. We've all heard that. Now, if that story is true, that also is evidence of a great advance because it means you've, un you've understood the pathology of disorders. 
and you now have something that fixes that pathology. And within medicine, that is a model for great advance. You, you understand the pathology of a disease, and you have something specific to that disease. So that's the story of progress. And in, two, in 1997, I think it was, U.S. Surgeon General David Satcher wrote a big report on mental health, and he said this, Prior to the arrival of Thorazine, we lacked treatments that would prevent people from, be, from becoming chronically ill. Then we got these drugs, and we, today we have a vast array of safe and effective treatments that, in essence, prevent people from becoming chronically ill and enable them to live fairly normal lives. Okay? So that's the story of progress. And, it is, and that is basically the narrative that drives everything. Our use of the medications, our laws, where we put our money in terms of you know, resources, etc. So what I did in this book as a first step towards putting that narrative of progress under a microscope was say, okay, if, these, if, if this paradigm of care makes it possible for people to function well, and before it didn't, then hopefully we're going to see the burden of mental illness in our society decrease as this revolution happens. Does that make sense? So what I did is, how many people were on government disability, unable to take care of themselves in 1955 at the start of this revolution? Now at that time we did not have a social services network to take care of people in the, in, you know, in the community. So people who were seen as disabled by mental illness were in mental hospitals. How many people were in mental hospitals in 1955? About 550,000. But you really have to dig into that data because the, me the mental hospitals at this time were also serving as nursing homes for people with like in-stage dementia, that sort of thing, Alzheimer's disease. There were actually 350,000 people with a psychiatric diagnosis at that time in mental hospitals. So you take that number, you look at the population at the time, and that's a disability rate of about one in every 500 Americans, okay? So that's at the start of this quote revolution. Now we now, we deinstitutionalize, right? As a society, we decide we're going to take care of people in the community. We empty our hospitals, and we set up a system in which people who can't care for themselves, in other words, they, they need a, a government payment, can get either SSI or SSD, okay? And so what other researchers have said, if you want to track the number of disabled mentally ill in our society, going forward in this era of deinstitutionalization, you have to look at people on SSI and SSDI due to mental illness. So I look at that number in 1987. How many people are on disability? At that moment Prozac arrives, it's 1.25 million adults. So during this era of the first generation psychiatric drugs, the number of people on disability rose from around 350,000 people to 1.25 million, etc. It increased. Now what people say was that's an unfair comparison. That's like an apples to oranges comparison. Maybe had to be much sicker, so to speak, to be in the hospital in 1955, to be on, then to be on disability in 1987. So now let's just look forward about the disability numbers since 1987 in this era of second generation drugs. Any guesses about how many people are on disability today due to mental illness? In other words, that's why they got declared eligible. Any idea of the number of adults? So in 1987, 1.25 million. How many today? What? Any guess? No, it's not 100 million. <laughs> we, we, we'd all be on it. <laughs> but it, it's, it's, it's closing in on 5 million. Okay, so during this time of the second generation, rather than this burden of mental illness decreasing, it's rising notably. And so now we went from at the start of this sort of psychopharmacological revolution where the disability was 1 in 500, we're now down to about 1 in 70, something like that. Now the other thing is, what's happening to children? So in 1987, there were 16,200 children in the United States who got a disability payment because they were said to be mentally ill. Today, there's 700,000 children. So this dramatic rise. And if you look at children who go on disability, about two-thirds go on, when they hit age 18, into adult disability. So it's like, it's like a new career path has opened up in our society where someone gets you know, diagnosed, said to be disabled as a kid, and now they, this is basically the life that is laid out for them. Now, the disability numbers don't prove anything about the merits of the drugs, but I think you can see they raise a question, right? Because generally when you get effective medical treatments for known diseases, the burden of that disease at the very least is going to stabilize in society, or hopefully even go down. 
And instead, we're seeing this rising burden of mental illness, and in all ages. Now, uh, and I'll go a little bit in a sense of what I think questions are raised by this. But So this book came out in 2010, and now there's been a number of foreign translations in various countries. And so as the translations come out, I get the disability numbers for other countries. Sweden, Germany, Italy, UK, well that's not a foreign translation obviously, but Iceland, New Zealand had a translation, Australia, and everywhere you see the same thing. Where you see a dramatic increase in the use of these medications, you're seeing dramatic increases in disability. So the point is this disability epidemic is not unique to the United States. It's not unique to our sort of healthcare delivery system, uh, you know, whatever. So it seems to be not just culture bound. So what questions do I think are raised by this? Or what questions did I raise about the medications in response to this disability data? Two questions. One, how do medications shape people's lives over the long term? Now this is a new question. Because the way that medications, psychiatric medications, and all medications basically get approved for use is We'll test them for six weeks or 12 weeks or 10 weeks, some short period of time, and we'll see if they beat placebo on some target symptom. So we supposedly have some way to measure depression, for example, and if the antidepressant reduces that, those symptoms of depression a little better than placebo, over the short term we say the drug is effective, right? It gets approved. But that testing process doesn't tell you anything about how you're shaping people's lives over the course of one year, two years, five years, 10 years. And it's also symptom bound. It's just telling you that you're reducing some symptoms of distress, mm -hmm. but does it tell you if the, if the person is working, socializing, how their physical health is? It doesn't tell you anything about that. So one of the things I wanted to do in this book was, was say, well, what is science telling us about how the medications shape people's lives over this longer period of time? And in, in these other functional domains, not just in symptom reduction. And the reason I think the book has gotten a fair amount of attention is I think it's the first book that really has sought to look at that question and look at what science is telling us about. So I think that's what's novel. Now the second thing I wanted to be on the alert for was this. If you dig into the disabilities uh, numbers, you see it's <coughs> the rise is being driven by an increase in affective disorders. It's actually not the psychotic disorders. Mm -hmm. So it's depression and, anybody want to guess? Anxiety. What? Anxiety. Well, anxiety, but actually... No, bipolar. Bipolar. Yeah. Okay, so bipolar used to be a rare disorder, and now it is what is really driving the disability numbers. So you want to ask you, the second question you want to ask in this book is, where are all the bipolar patients coming from? Because here's the prevalence. 30, 40 years ago, the prevalence of manic depressive illness, which is what it was called in, was around 1 in 5,000. So 1 in 5,000 adults would have an episode of, quote, manic depressive illness each year. So what's the prevalence today of bipolar? Any guesses? It's about 1 in 50. So there's been a hundredfold increase in the prevalence of bipolar, and we want to know why. Where is that coming from? So what I'll do now is I'll address briefly those two questions, what you sort of find. And the first is, how do medications shape long-term outcomes? Now, in the book, I do this for uh, sch you know, psychotic disorders, schizophrenia slash psychotic disorders. I do it for anxiety. I do it for depression. And I do it for bipolar as well, sort of the major ones. And then I also look at you know, what are the long-term effects of ADHD medications mm. on children, SSRI. So I also do it for kids. But maybe what we'll focus on, obviously, I can't do all that literature here tonight. Uh, but I'll focus real briefly on the antipsychotics in adults. And the reason I want to do the antipsychotics in adults is this. If there's any class of drugs that should have a clear benefit profile over the long term, it should be the antipsychotics. One, in that story of progress, they're at the heart of that progress, that story. They're the drugs that made it possible to, do, to deinstitutionalize, right? Second, we have laws governed, organized around the concept that these are necessarily helpful drugs. And that anybody who does not want to take his antipsychotic, it, it lacks insight. So if there should be any class of drugs where it is quite clear that they provide a long-term benefit, it's the antipsychotic. Hey, Mary, how are you? Nice to see you. <laughs> 
I don't even know her. <laughs> you all know Mary, right? Yeah. Woo! Very cool. She's been such a force for change. Good change. Woo! So, real quickly, the literature around antipsychosis. So, the evidence for antipsychotic consists of basically a couple of points. Going back to the 50s and 60s, they ran studies where people came into emergency rooms. They were either randomized to drug, randomized to placebo. And after six weeks, generally, those randomized to drug had a greater abatement of their psychotic symptoms. Okay, So that shows short-term efficacy. It's not as pronounced as you think, but generally it's there. Okay. Now, doctors have this question. How long should they keep people on the antipsychotics? Right? So you now have this new drug. They're keeping them on. And they ran studies designed like this. They took that group of people that, were, that had stabilized well on the drug, and it's got to be good responders because you need people who are stable for these studies. And in that select group, they would abruptly withdraw the drug from half the patients, and the other half they would maintain on the drug, on the antipsychotic. And with great <coughs> regularity, those withdrawn from the medication, abruptly so, relapsed. They had a return of their psychotic symptoms. So doctors said, see, you take away the drug, the disease returns, this is why you got to stay on these drugs forever. Okay? And it's those relapse studies that are the evidence base for long-term use. And you can, you can, and it was like in 2002, the New England Journal of Medicine had an article, how do we know these drugs are effective for long-term? They said it's the relapse studies. Okay, so what's the flaws with the relapse literature? Well, there's a, there's a number of flaws. First of all, it's the abrupt withdrawal. We now know that that exaggerates the risk of relapse. And by the way, there are very few graduate withdrawal studies in the literature. They found a few where they had sort of a, a, a proxy for graduate withdrawal in which people had been on an injectable, and then they didn't get the next injection, and the idea is that drug left more slowly. And even in those studies, the relapse rate was much less than in the abrupt withdrawal studies. So that tells you that literature is flawed by design. Now, the, the design of the studies. The next thing is, do those relapse studies tell you anything about how the people are functioning? Are they working? Are they in good health? Are they engaged in life? They don't, right? What they tell you is, if you're on the drug, don't go off abruptly. But they don't really tell you what you're doing. And now let's imagine this. Let's imagine a study. This group comes in. You're all psychotic, OK? <laughs> but this group comes in. We put on medication right from the beginning. And this group, we never put on medication. And now we just follow a group for five years. And we see how this group's doing on medication. And we see how this group that's never been exposed to medication, how they're doing, whether you're psychotic or whether you're working. This is what we might call the natural course of the disorder, the never exposed course. The relapse studies don't tell you about this. They don't tell you about what might be happening in the absence of exposure to medication. Okay, And what that is important is this. Go back to the Hippocratic Oath. Well, I'm just going around in circles. Right? <laughs> Go back to the Hippocratic Oath. Do no harm, right? So what does do no harm mean? Anybody, what does do no harm mean? I make it worse. Okay, that's what we think it means. It doesn't mean that. What, what did she say? Don't make it worse. And in a sense, that is how it is usually interpreted, that, that phrase for doctors. Don't make your patients worse. But what Hippocrates was really getting at was this. There is often a capacity in nature to recover from an illness. And in order for your intervention to do no harm, it has to beat that natural recovery rate. So for to go back to this unmedicated group here, if half of them get better from a psychotic episode, or just are better, in order to do no harm, we need more than half over here getting better. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's what it means. And so you don't really know about how effective your therapy is until you can start to figure out what is the natural capacity to heal from these different things. So I go through the book, and, you, and I'm now <coughs> trying to put together this, this logic. So the next step, knowing that the relapse studies are flawed, what I'm going to do is going to go, OK, is there other research out there that shows, in fact, uh, research of different types that is showing that medication, antipsychotic medications, are improving long-term outcomes. And I'm, gonna, and I'm gonna see if other people in the literature, mainstream people, have addressed that question and what are they reporting. What you do 
when you search the literature, you find this. People say, we don't have that data. We have no such studies. So for example, Manuel Stick from the McGill Uni uh, University of Montreal in 2002, he said this. After 50 years of using antipsychotics, do we really know these drugs are effective? And he says, when it comes to their long-term effects, there is no compelling evidence on the matter. And then he says something really key. He says, one thing is for sure. We take a genuine look, a risk, at taking a closer look at what we have as long been considered true, meaning that we may be surprised by what we find. Okay? So this opens up, for me, the sense that it's a legitimate exercise to try to figure out how the drugs affect long-term outcomes. So here's what I did. I'm now going to go through the history of the science around these drugs and see if there is literature that can put together a pretty compelling picture of how antipsychotic medications and do affect outcomes in the aggregate. So the first thing I want to do is this. What sort of outcomes were we getting before Thorazine arrived? Right? This is the, the, the common memory is that people were chronic and couldn't get out of the mental hospital, right? That's what that narrative says. And the very first thing you find is that's not true. So if you go back from between 1945 to 1955 and look at uh, outcomes for first episodes of schizophrenia patients, you'll find that it goes like this. And by the way, where I got this inf information from was from a conference held in 1956 by the National Institute of Mental Health that asked this question. What sort of outcomes do we see today, now that we're starting to use these drugs, before the use of the drugs? Because in fact, we want to see if we're doing better. Well, what they found in those studies from 1945 to 55 was that about 70% of patients would be discharged within 12 to 18 months. So that means about 30% aren't getting discharged, and that's going to become your chronic population. But 70%, in fact, the psychosis is abating or whatever, the dysfunction to the degree people can be discharged and go out back in society. Okay? Now, employment rates, by the way, in the discharge groups are around 60%. Okay? So people are going back and working. They're not going back on sort of disability. And if you look at five-year outcome studies, roughly two-thirds of the patients of that first episode cohort are actually out in the community. So this framework we have, that it wasn't until Thorazine arrived that it was possible for people to live in the community who've had a psychotic break, a schizophrenia diagnosis, it's not true. It's what happens is you end up with a chronic population, because there is the segment. But in fact, a lot of people, in fact, are getting better and able to go back. That's the first thing. So the second thing is, real quickly, did the arrival of the antipsychotics increase those discharge rates? In other words, for first episode. Well, California did a study of that for all of its first episode patients in 56 and 57, in all the hospitals in the, in the, in the state system. And what they found is that hospitals that were regular, regularly medicating all the first episode uh, patients actually had lower discharge rates. So that idea that this is what made it possible, there's no evidence that in fact it speeded up the discharge of, of first episode patients. Okay. All right, now going forward. Next step. Okay, now I'm going to try to find out whatever research is out there on this question. The first long-term study we have of antipsychotics, it, it's done in the 1960s. It's, it, it comes out of a nine-hospital study, four arms. Three groups are randomized to drug, one to placebo. At the end of six weeks, the drug-treated patients are doing better. Okay? In fact, this study is seen as still as a, an essential part of the evidence base. It's this study which causes psychiatry to rename the drugs before they were known as major tranquilizers. Because of this efficacy after six weeks, they said these are not just major tranquilizers. They're anti-schizophrenic drugs. They're anti-psychotic drugs. Okay, key study. But in fact, a lot of the placebo patients got better. Then they're discharged. And then they look at how people are doing a year later. And they notice something odd. The groups and the three groups that were initially treated with drugs have higher rehospitalization rates at the end of one year. So at this very beginning moment of the research literature, you see the vaguest hint of the paradox. Drugs that are effective over the short term, could they be increasing the chronicity over the long term? Okay. Next, I wanted to say, well, what were clinicians saying at this time, who had been working in hospitals prior to the arrival of the drugs, so they knew what was happening to patients before the drugs. Now they have this new tool and they're seeing a different course, right? What do they say? They say this when you, when you look at them. Boy, my patients are getting better faster. But boy, are they coming back to the hospital in droves. Mm -hmm. And they even, they even 
this is when you get this description of the revolving door syndrome we've all hit about. It comes from this time because now people are coming back a lot. And then you see this too, and it also, and this comes from the very uh, up uh, the highest levels of the NIMH. That is, it's called the Psychopharmacology Service Center that was set up to study these new drugs. Jonathan Cole, who was at McLean's Hospital, and he was the head of it, he says. The other thing it seems like, if you relapse while on drug, you now are getting more severe relapses than we used to see on placebo. So a worry arises around these clinical impressions. So in the 1970s, the NIMH funds three trials that basically are, are, are meant to revisit this question, are these drugs effective over the longer term? And they had different designs for, for, for certain. Time purposes, I won't go through them. But basically, they ran studies in which it compares kind of standard of care, usual care, versus some form of experimental care where there's a lot of psychosocial care. And drugs are used in this way. They're not immediately put on the medication, and some group will get better. But then if they're not getting better after, say, six weeks, they'll be put on the medication. And then they're going to be followed for one, two, and three years. And what you find in all three studies is this. In those experimental arms, there's a significant percentage of people that never needed to go on drug, got better, and it's that group that was able to get better without going on drug that has the better outcomes, at, the best outcomes at two and three years. So you can see a subset never needed to go on the drug. That's one outcome. Two outcomes, on the whole, you see, you're still my medicated group. <laughs> you see higher relapse rates in this group, okay? On the whole. And that because of that, a man named William Carpenter raises a really profound question. And this is like in 1978. He says, we know that once you're on a drug, you're at a higher risk of relapse if you come off it than if you stay on. That's the relapse that is. He says, but we raised the question, what would have happened if they never would have been placed on the drug to begin with? We raised the possibility that the drugs are causing a, a change that is making people more biologically prone to psychosis than they would be in the normal course of their illness. So you can see why this is so profound. We're talking not about an adverse effect, but their effect on the target symptom. Mm -hmm. And the worry is that the drug is causing some change that's making you more biologically prone to psychosis. There was one other study done at this time. It was a retrospective study out of Boston Psychopathic Hospital. And they looked at their outcomes in 1967 with, for a group treated with with, with drugs and psychosocial care, and another in 1947 without drugs, and they found that the 1947 cohort had much better outcomes, much less socially dependent, much more likely to be working. In fact, in 47, five years later, 76% were working and basically doing okay. All right? So at this point, we're now around 1980. Some researchers from McGill University put together an explanation for what they think is happening. And it goes like this. Real quickly, how do, how do neurons communicate in the brain? You have a, uh, a presynaptic neuron that releases a chemical we call a chemical messenger into that tiny gap between neurons, which we call the synaptic cleft. And then that molecule binds with receptors on the receiving neuron, which we call the postsynaptic neuron, and that's how the neurons communicate. Now, what antipsychotics do is they block these receptors, these dopamine receptors, a, a molecule called do a neurotransmitter called dopamine. And at a therapeutic dose, they block about 70% of a particular subtype of receptor called the D2 receptor. So they're thwarting dopamine transmission, okay? Now, once researchers understood that uh, uh, this is how antipsychotics work, they hypothesized, well, maybe schizophrenia is due to too much dopamine. And that comes from the dopamine hypothesis. So watch this science. So first they say, well, maybe the problem is people with schizophrenia put out too much dopamine, okay? Those neurons put out too much dopamine. And what happens when that dopamine goes into that synaptic cleft? Now, the brain has to have a way to remove it from the synaptic cleft in order to end the messaging. And it, it removes it in one of two ways. The dopamine is either goes up back into the presynaptic neuron, or an enzyme comes along and metabolizes it and breaks it into metabolites. And those metabolites show up in the cerebral spinal fluid. Mm -hmm. So researchers said this. If people with schizophrenia are putting out too much dopamine, they should see extra levels of metabolites in the cerebral spinal fluid. So they did studies, and they announced, we got it. We have found the cause of schizophrenia. They have too many, they have abnormal amounts of metabolites in their cerebral spinal fluid. 
1970s. You can see that. The, the Nature and the New York Times says it looks like the cause of schizophrenia has been found. But you've got to read the paper. The researchers said, we don't know if this is the disease or the drug. Mm. And what they found is in never medicated people, they did not have higher levels of metabolites. Mm -hmm. So what they're beginning to flesh out now here is that this is a compensatory response. So the drug acts as a break, blocks dopamine. Your brain now has all these feedback receptors and it goes, uh-oh, this is a problem. I have to maintain what they call a homeostatic equilibrium, the normal functioning. And one of the ways it does it is the presynaptic neurons start putting out more dopamine. And that's why they were seeing these extra levels of metabolites. Now that compensatory adaptation actually tends to burn out after a while. But anyway, once, once researchers understood that, they said, okay, maybe the abnormality is that people with schizophrenia have too many dopamine receptors. That's the hyperactivity. So now at, at, uh, they have some schizophrenia patients who died, and an autopsy, uh, they, they do an autopsy, and they see that, yes, they have some way of labeling this. They have 50%, 70%, 100% extra density of dopamine receptors. Again, you hear that you can read this. We have found the cause of schizophrenia. It's too many dopamine receptors. Then you've got to read the paper. But is this in unmedicated people, or is it only in medicated people? And what they found, of course, is that it's a response. It's a compensatory mechanism. Prior to being medi med medicated, they do not have an abnormal density. But after you go on, you do. So the irony of this story is this. Schizophrenia slash psychosis was hypothesized to be due to too much dopamine, either by presynaptic neurons putting out too much or by the receptor, having too many receptors. What they literally found is that prior to going on a medication, you don't have that abnormality. But after you, you're on, you do. <clears throat> so the drugs were found to induce the very abnormality hypothesized to cause psychosis in the first place. So what these researchers, Guy Chouinard and Barry Jones, said is what these drugs do is cause a dopamine supersensitivity, and that has two consequences. So let's go back to this. The drug acts as a brake. The brain puts down the accelerator. Now come off abruptly. What do you got down? <coughs> We're saying this is why you're getting these severe relapses. It's because mm. now you really do have a, a chemical imbalance. But then they said, okay, so that's a problem. Now how about if you remain on the drug? And they said, Maybe this isn't the best way to have that dopaminergic system function. And maybe you're going to get something they call part of psychosis, where psychosis becomes more permanent. And they did a study, and remember they, what was happening, they were getting something called tardive dyskinesia, mm. which was a, 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 an area of the brain becoming sort of permanently um, malfunctioning. That's the basal ganglia. Mm -hmm. They said, if we get a similar dysfunction in the limbic system, maybe we're going to get permanent psychosis. And they, can, they did a study and they concluded that after 10 years, about 30% of their patients had tardive psychosis. And they said, when that happens, new symptoms of greater severity will appear. So this happens in 1980, okay? And by the way, we're going to end, try to hurry this up. We're going to end with a study that just came out this week. And we'll see a, a story that stretches across 50 years. So that happens in the 1980s. So what is, what, what, imagine I'm giving this presentation to psychiatrists in 1982. And I say, it looks like your medications are making people more vulnerable to psychosis. Mm. What do you think the psychiatrist said? Well, it's just too much to take in. Mm. I mean, it's just like, it's, it's just the cognitive dissonance that's going to erupt now. Is just, and there's stories about psychiatrists standing up going, are you telling me that the very drug I'm using to treat psychosis is making people more psychotic? It just becomes almost impossible to sort of intake. And it's also not what they see. This is beautiful science illuminating a paradox, okay? Mm. They see that the drugs work. They see that people go crash when they go off. They don't see that this new course is related. That's not what they clinically see. So this is actually beautiful science illuminating something that's not immediately apparent. Anyway, this worry now is swept aside, okay? It just is pushed aside, and then we get the new atypical antipsychotics, and we said we're in this new era. So now the question is, is this a real concern or not, 30 years later? <clears throat> and here's the type of research you can find since then. World Health Organization studies that compared outcomes in India, Colombia, and Nigeria to outcomes in the U.S. and other rich countries found that the outcomes are much better in the poor countries at the end of two years and five years, two different studies. After the first such study, they looked at medication use. They said, well, maybe the reason for the better outcomes in the poor countries 
is there more medication compliance? So it's a valid hypothesis. <laughs> Medications are supposed to be so essential, compliance should be with better outcomes. And what they found is in the poor countries, they use the drugs differently. They use them acutely, not chronically. Only 16% of patients were regularly maintained on the drugs. Okay, that's a cross-cultural study. <clears throat> Going forward, um, let's see if I can remember all this. Uh, you, and there's different types of, of research on this. This next part is really, I think, sort of upsetting. There's a lot that's going to be upsetting. Um, real quickly, this, this, this talk is never meant to be a, a, a medical advice to talk. Just sort of what, for we as a society, what we can think about this, please do not take anything as something you should make a medical decision based on anything here tonight. The next thing is they got MRI technologies in the 1990s, and now they can start studying brain volumes, okay? The first such research was done out of, um, uh, out of the University of Pennsylvania. What they found is that over time you actually get a swelling related to antipsychotics in the basal ganglia. And they said as the swelling occurs, you see an increase in psychotic symptoms. So this was an MRI that actually supported the idea that maybe the drugs were increasing sort of vulnerability to psychosis. Then we had a long-running study done by Nancy Andreessen, MRI study. Uh, she's the former editor of the American Journal of Psychiatry. So someone, she's the author of a book called The Broken Brain. She helped introduce this whole, whole idea. Big study, 500 people. Her hypothesis was this. Schizophrenia is a neurodegenerative disease characterized by brain volume loss over time. So she measured this, and that's what she found. That over time, she got this steadily declining brain volume in people diagnosed with schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. Then the question, and, and okay, that's your first finding. Okay, I found it, it's a neurodegenerative disease. Then she looked at, as this shrinkage happens, what happens to symptoms? And she found out that, that this shrinkage is associated with worsening of negative symptoms. That's the emotional disengagement. Um, negative symptoms, well, there was the second one, I'm sorry. Oh, and cognitive function over time. So was, that's what you, and functional impairment. So she's saying that's a disease process, and unfortunately our drugs don't stop that disease process. But there were studies in monkeys, macaque monkeys, that found brain shrinkage, and obviously the macaque monkeys didn't have schizophrenia. So then she had asked the question, well, maybe the drug is doing this. And she reported in my 2010, it's clear that the more drug you're given, the more shrinkage there is. Now you can see why this is alarming, because this is, a, this is really a picture of an iatrogenic process. You're given an outside agent. Um, as that agent causes a morphological change, and as that change happens, you're seeing these, this worsening of symptoms. Okay. Going forward, um, we now have a study done by Martin Harrow. Martin Harrow is a, is a psychologist at the University of Illinois, beginning in the late 1970s, early 1980s. He enrolled 200 psychotic patients into a study from two Chicago area hospitals, one private, one public. And it's a naturalistic study. Um, everyone treated with drugs, discharged, and I was just going to follow them up at two years, four and a half years, seven and a half years, 10 years, 15 years, and 20 years. And in each assessment, he's going to look at, are you taking medication, are you symptomatic, are you working, etc. And here's what he found. Of the 200, 64 actually ended up with a schizophrenia diagnosis, okay? And by the way, he kept 77% of those patients in his study throughout the 15 years, which is really good. And even after that, he now was left with 64 patients. Of the 64, 25 had gotten off antipsychotic medications. Wouldn't happen today, but this is in the early 80s when there was more possibility for this. And here's what he found. At the end of two years, there wasn't much difference in outcomes between the two groups. Functional, psychotic symptoms, anxiety symptoms, whatever you want to look at, they're basically the same. And then we see in his data something we see nowhere else. Between year two and four and a half, those who were off by year two got a lot better on every domain. Cognitive function, a great diminishment of psychotic symptoms, uh, recovery rates, employment rates, everything. Anxiety went way down. Whereas those on drug basically stayed the same, or actually their anxiety went up. That is the only place in the literature you see this healing that is taking place, this capacity to recover at this lengthy time. Those relapse studies don't capture that. Anyway, 
He published that data, his 15-year data, his 20-year data. That is really now upsetting the apple cart. And he just published this week a look at just on the psychotic symptoms. And there's two things about that. Actually, the people who stayed on medication were pretty persistently psychotic throughout the 15 and 20 years. So like 60, 70 percent are having psychotic symptoms every time he does the follow-up. In other words, the drugs weren't reducing psychosis. If you look at those who got it off year two, almost none were psychotic at the follow-ups. They got better by year four and a half, and the stability is fantastic, not relapsing at all. There's almost no relapses in that group going forward. So what you see in this data is that at the very least is there's a subset of people who can get off and do really well and stay stable. And we really need to recognize that. Anyway, his paper that is just coming out is basically raising this question. Do these drugs, in fact, increase you know, this biological vulnerability to psychosis? Rather than being effective, they're actually exacerbating the problem. So this just came out this week, and you can imagine. My point is, this worry that sh shows up in the 60s, it's coming back full circle now. We also got a random, the complaint about uh, HERO was that it wasn't randomized. We got a randomized study out of, um, out of the Netherlands. It goes like this. They take people who are stabilized. Half are, are ta uh, put on a, 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 go to an arm where you uh, taper either all the way off or to a very low dose. Other maintenance care as usual. And what did they find? At the end of two years, not much difference in the functional outcomes. Actually, there was no real difference. But actually, there is more relapse Okay, you're my tapered group in here. Mm -hmm. there's, there's more relapse in this group, okay? There, there are. It's like, I forget the amount, but there's quite a few more relapses in the withdrawn group than the maintained group. But they're minor relapses. They manage those relapses. They're not causing relapse hospitalization. Now, what happens between year two and seven? This group, the medicated group, continues to relapse. And this group does not much such that by the end of seven years, the relapse rate's a little bit higher in this group, and the big thing is the recovery rate. This group has a much higher recovery rate. And so what the Netherlands researchers said is, we've been looking at the wrong thing. We've been looking just at symptom control over the short term, or in the relapse studies, and we have lost this longer perspective. And he says, what we really need to be looking at is this capacity to heal over the longer period. Support that. <clears throat> and also, not just focus on symptom control. Focus on what people can do. So believe it or not, because of Harrow and this study, the head of the NIMH said recently, Tom Insel, he raised the very question that's, her that's basically heresy. Do these drugs impair recovery over the long term? Now, when this book was published four years ago, 2010, I was attacked rather viciously for basically saying that's what the data is showing but it shows how things are changing. And what this really compels us is you need to rethink the use of these medications. And really, I think you need to rethink them around two principles, is you want to see if you can get people through that first episode without going on the medication, because you'll see that there's a subset can do well. And then you want to see, if you do use the medication to stabilize, who can come off as successful? A selective use model. And the beauty of this story is there's a group in northern Finland that adopted that model of care in 1992, that protocol. And by the way, it doesn't mean you don't do anything else. Mm -hmm. It means you provide a lot of psychosocial care. You help people reintegrate into society, get jobs, that whole thing, build a new narrative. So this is not do nothing. It's do a lot. It's just use drugs in this model. They now have by far the best outcomes in the Western world. 80% of their patients, first episode patients, are working or back in school and asymptomatic at the end of five years. If you look at medication use, it goes like this. 67% never exposed to an antipsychotic in five years. By the way, they do use benzos to restore sleep weight, so this is not an anti-med model. It's sort of the best use model. Another 13% have been on the drug antipsychotics temporarily, and about 20% now are on them regularly. Find it, it helps us a group of people. So, what is this, why is this story important? Because it's telling, it is a complicated story of science, but it's telling us we've been doing things wrong. The, our one size fits all model, and this chemical imbalance story, it's not, that's not a story of science. What science has been presenting us with is actually a very optimistic story, because we're, you're actually seeing people that we said are, 
having a serious problem, a serious episode, many of those people can get better. And as the people in Finland will tell you, we used to think psychosis was chronic. Now we know it is largely episodic. Mm -hmm. But it takes a long time to heal, and you have to be with people. It's not six days, it's not three weeks. They say it might take one, and what the data is showing that, look at that Harrow data. Mm -hmm. It's like healing happening between year two and five. It's a, it's a long healing process. So what the story I just told you is this. We need to rethink you, see these minutes. And really along a, a principle of figuring out for whom and for how long. And also a principle of actually trying to minimize. Because this problem I talked about where the drug, uh, the brain compensates for the presence of the drug, that happens in all classes of drugs. So for example, how about antidepressants? Antidepressants block the reuptake of the serotonin, right? Mm -hmm. So serotonin stays longer in that synaptic cleft. In that case, it's acting as an accelerator, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, that, that messaging signal is longer between the neurons. So what do you think the brain does? It puts down the brake on the serotonergic system. Mm -hmm. It reduces the density of serotonergic receptors. So now you have the same problem. When you come off, you've got this sort of serotonergic system that is in a subsensitive state, and that can lead to withdrawal symptoms, but also sort of a difficulty of ever sort of, <clears throat> it makes coming off, it makes two things. It makes, it can lead to withdrawal symptoms, but it also means if you stay on what they're finding, it can lead to a chronic depression. Mm -hmm. So what you're finding with antidepressants is, depression used to be seen as an episodic illness. It's been reconceptualized as a chronic illness. And you can see now papers raising this very question. And it's a paper by Rifel Malik, who's actually a mood disorders person, I think, for Eli Lilly. He says, these drugs it appear to induce what he calls a tardive dysphoria. And he, when he talks about it, he gathers all the evidence for it. And he says, the problem is, it's that these drugs induce what he's calling oppositional tolerance. Mm -hmm. The brain tries to compensate for the presence of the drug, and that drives it in the, the brain in the opposite direction of what you want. So this is starting to become understood as sort of a universal problem with long-term use of psychiatric drugs, is they stir this oppositional response, and that oppositional response has these consequences. It can make coming off the drug difficult. It can mean staying on the drug actually becomes problematic, because basically that system's not working so well. And the other thing that's coming out is this. We always assume that when you came off the drug, you know, the density, the density of those receptors would renormalize. That is maybe not so. There's increasing worry, such in the Refel Mallet's paper, that at least in a certain percentage of people, those changes are irreversible. And that's why, in fact, it can be so hard ever to get off. And once, now that science needs to be fleshed out some more. But if that indeed turns out to be the case, you can see that going on a medication becomes a profound thing. You're going to change the brain, and basically you're going to send your life down a certain course. So final thing on this, and then I'll, I'll get done and talk real briefly about bipolar. When we talk about drugs increasing the chronicity of disorders, <coughs> it doesn't mean that nobody is doing well on the drugs. Go back to that Hippocratic oath. It just means compared in particular to that what we're seeing in natural recovery rates, we're increasing the likelihood that a person will become chronic, but it doesn't mean no one's doing well on the drugs. And, okay, just so that's really clear. But of course, from a societal point of view, that's what you want to know, right? In terms of what we embrace. And also, I think when someone comes into care, and you're gonna have an informed consent process, all this should be laid out for a person. Okay, real quickly. And, and by the way, basically you see this in the, in the literature over and over again as you try to flesh out the long-term outcomes. You see clinicians going like, wow, my patients are getting better faster, but they're relapsing more. And then you'll see people w wondering about what's going on. You'll see that outcomes are now more chronic. And then you'll see some people point to this biological thing. And that seems like to be the common theme across uh, indications. The other problem with psych drugs is this, is they can stir basically an emotional instability. They, so for example, stimulants. Think about what a stimulant does. It arouses you, right? And then you sort of crash. So they get an arousal dysphoric thing going on. So what do you think that predisposes you for? 
will bipolar. So if you look at kids on stimulants, something like 10% will convert to bipolar in two to four years. Yeah. Now the other thing about stimulants is they can cause psychotic episodes, and that's another route to a bipolar diagnosis. So where are all the bipolar patients coming from? One is stimulants, especially among the kids. Mm -hmm. The second is SSRI use. <coughs> so SSRIs are known to be able to occasionally stir manic episodes, that sort of thing. It's, it's quite clear in the literature. It's even in the DSM. And for example, they did a survey not too long ago of all the people, members of the DBSA, that's the Depression Bipolar Support Alliance Group, and they asked those who had a bipolar diagnosis, how many of you had your first um, manic episode while on, after being exposed to an antidepressant? So what percentage of people said, rose their, raised their hand? Any guess? Well, it was 60%. So that's a clear, um, pathway to bipolar. There's just no question about it. So, And by the way, every society where you see a lot of use of SSRIs, you see a, a dramatic increase in bipolar. Now the third uh, route to bipolar, why we're seeing some more, and I hate to say this because it's always very unpopular, but it is marijuana use. Thank you. Thank you. It really is. I'm sorry. It's, Thank look, you. There's no question about it. The data is really solid on this. Could you Thank say you. that again? Yeah, I can't. Marijuana use among the young is a risk factor for becoming bipolar. And you know, marijuana is stronger than it used to be today, uh, than it used to be. The marijuana we have today is stronger than it used to be. And uh, there's been different well-controlled studies that quantify the risk and they can see that there's an elevated risk with say regular use among 17 year olds and 18 year olds. I will say anecdotally, when I was doing this book and I interviewed maybe 70, 80 people, who've been hospitalized, et cetera. This, uh, not everybody, of course, but I heard a lot of stories was I went to college and I did a lot of drugs and then I had my, my break and, and I've been a mental patient. So that's a risk as well. And then finally, they completely changed the boundaries, the diagnostic criteria for bipolar. Mm -hmm. You used to have to be hospitalized for both poles. Now you don't have to be hospitalized for either. Your time manic is lesser. So there's that's part of it too, is there's this diagnostic expansion. but. If you look at the bipolar boom, that's an example of a paradigm of care that is creating mental patients. In other words, it used to be rare, but now it's being, it's frequent. But if you really sit down with bipolar patients, you know, people with that diagnosis, you'll f it's rare for someone just to sort of enter initially into the bipolar diagnosis. You'll see depression, stimulants, you know, marijuana, other drug use. And then you know that stirs up some emotional instability. Next thing you know, they're in the bipolar camp. Once they're in the bipolar camp, uh, you know you get a lot of drugs often, polypharmacy, and you see poor functioning, etc. So that's an example where this paradigm of care is really it's it's just creating more mental patients, so to speak. And I don't mean to be using that. I'm using that term in the sense of what we're seeing in society. So, what's the message of anatomy? of an epidemic. I think the reaction to the book is revealing. Initially, I, there was some really vicious attacks. It was like, this guy's a heretic, and that sort of thing. But the book has had real staying power. And the reason it's had staying power is because it, it, it's, in fact, it's just a review of the science that's out there. And this is why, like, in fact, I've asked, been asked by some medical schools to give grand rounds. It's because they've gone through it and they see, well, he, this is bringing something to our attention that should have been to our attention, but we hadn't seen before. And so particularly people of goodwill are, are seeking to, to sort of grapple with this information and figure out what can be done differently. So what is the message? One, we've got to rethink this paradigm of care. It's really not an effective way. I'm, I'm going to talk about a really drug-centered paradigm of care. Mm -hmm that makes the prescribing of drugs really easy and then we just sort of one size fits all. There's no evidence it's lessening the burden of mental illness in our society. In fact, it's that it's greatly exacerbating it. Two, on an individual level, it does increase the risk really of becoming more chronically symptomatic and not able to function as well. But there's also a good news message in this. And the good news message is, is that we have reconceptualized psychiatric disorders as chronic, right? You hear this. That is something that arose now 
that sort of fits what they're seeing. But if we go back into nature, what we really see is a lot of resilience and a lot of capacity to have a manic episode or have a severe depressive episode or have a psychotic episode and have that episode pass. Especially if you give the right psychosocial care early on. Mm -hmm. Psychosocial care that helps people reintegrate, Amen. right? Mm -hmm. Jobs, shelter, uh, you know, build a social community. Also, you know, help people eat well, exercise well. So there's really a, a message of great optimism amidst this sort of gloom. And I'll leave you with this comment. Sanborn Bach was a, a psychiatrist at Boston Psychopathic Hospital. He had been there like in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. He did that retrospective study I was talking about. He says this, my experience teaches me that most mental illness, especially the most severe, are largely episodic in nature unless we do something to turn them chronic. And that's the message that we need to revisit. We need to rediscover this capacity in human beings to suffer, to lose their way, be extremely depressed, whatever it might be, but really to get their lives back. And then we need to build a system that really supports people in, in achieving that possibility. And then the only other message is, I would say, is why are we medicating all our kids? And that's another thing, but if it's not working so well for adults, you think the literature is showing it's working well for kids? That literature is even more frightening. Mm -hmm. so, thank you. Um, yeah, um, I'm just wondering, I just want to throw this out to everybody um, that may or may not have seen um, footage of Dr. Bregan or know about Dr. Bregan. Um, you're familiar with Dr. Bregan? I know Peter pretty well. Yeah. Um, it's just very sad to me that the two of you are seen as heretics, and I would have to put you in the same league as Bernie Sanders. <laughs> and, well, that's very flattering because I like Bernie Sanders a lot. I <laughs> figure as much. <laughs> no, that was presumption on my part, but um, I'm just really glad that you're here. I'm, oh, thank you. I, I I'm grateful, hugely grateful. Well, thank you. I've been up to Vermont now a number of times, mm -hmm. and you know, in different groups that are really, I think, trying to uh, grapple with this and what to do different. And you, by the way, have one of the best uh, a doctor who's an inspiration to me. And that's Sandy Steingart at Howard Center. Because she's she is really trying to change her thinking on this in response to this evidence base. And you'll see she just wrote a blog about we need to rethink the use of these psych drugs around the very principles we talked about here. And she was not there four years ago. So and she's gone to Finland where to sort of study this. Her name again? Sandy Steingart. And she's at Howard Center, and I'm not exactly yeah, sure. Yeah, I think I've seen her online. Yeah. Anyway, she's an example of someone with an open mind. Mm -hmm. She's changing her thinking in response to this evidence base, which is really admirable. Mm -hmm. Very short. What is SSRI? Oh, that's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And that's a description for an antidepressant like Prozac, Paxil, mm -hmm. Zoloft. You know all those advertisements where if you take it, you end up walking on a beach with a beautiful person? <laughs> That's an SSR. <laughs> it's amazing. Okay. Now we'll go here. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you paint a very good picture of how the current modality of psychiatry is making actually outcomes worse. Um, much literature will show that psychiatry has started making outcomes of mental illness worse long before the um, use of medications. And I wondered if you thought there was any other overarching uh, practices in psychiatry that led to that. Here's the, so my first book was a book called Mad in America that looks at the treatment of, quote, the seriously mentally ill from colonial times until today. And one recurring theme you see is, is this. 
a couple recurring things. One is that treatments that quiet people and make them, from the vantage point of the caretakers, so to speak, less bothersome, mm -hmm. are seen as effective. Mm -hmm. So you have this question, is the therapy designed to benefit the person? Mm -hmm. Or is it to benefit, is basically benefit those who are running? You know, so you see that 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 misconnection or that mis that problem all the way back to colonial days. And basically, any therapy that quiets people, weakens people, makes them less sort of physically agitated, is is seen as helpful. So or that's one thing. Prison. What's that? Or puts them in prison. Or puts them in prison. <laughs> And so you have that. So you, you, the question is, who are you serving, so to speak? The other part of this sort of how psychiatry historically has evaluated its therapies, it begins with, in fact, not a lot of respect for the person. In other words, a, a valuation of, of their lives and in terms of meaning, what they might want to accomplish, social, you know, all those sort of things. And so there's a certain sense that we don't look there's a, it's like creating the other. Do you know what I mean by this? Mm -hmm. That somehow people are less than, and once we designate people as less than, we can say things are okay for them that we wouldn't say that are okay for, for everyone else. And you see this most dramatically with lobotomy. Mm -hmm. So lobotomy is introduced in the 1940s, and you all know about lobotomy. Basically, they destroyed the frontal lobes, okay? And they did it in different ways. One surgery, they'd come in like this, with, with basically knives, and then it would just go like this, and it would sever the frontal lobes. The other way they did it is they, you'd lie down on a cot and they'd drill a, an ice pick in through your eyeballs, and they just scramble your frontal lobes. Now, what are your frontal lobes? If I had a, if I had a chimp brain and a human brain, they look a lot alike except for one thing. This human brain would have bigger frontal lobes. So it's really the very part of us that makes human makes us human, right? It's where we worry about ourselves self-consciousness, etc. So when, when lobotomy is introduced, it's seen as a miracle therapy. A mi the doctors have learned to pluck madness from the brain. And there, you can see like in Reader's Digest, New York Times, they're like master watchmakers that know the inner workings and they have found the very part of the brain where madness is and they can pluck it out. And then there was a big review of uh, uh, the first, like, I don't know, 500 lobotomies. And here's what they said in the review. Virtually no one gets worse. <laughs> it's like virtually no one gets worse. You can't harm people with this. <clears throat> some people stay the same, but, and then some people who are somewhat better, and some people are completely cured. And in 1949, based partly on that understanding, the inventor of surgical lobotomy won the Nobel Prize in medicine. Okay, he got me so why did they see it that way? It's because they, were, they, they really had completely devalued the people who were being operated on. So for example, you can see in the books, they'll say like this, this person post-operation no longer cares about the world. This person now who used to play the piano and used to worry about how history might have gone if the indigenous cultures had won, no longer worries about person is now content often to sit by the window and to watch the life go by. Mm -hmm. And when it comes time to eat, they'll come to the table and sometimes they'll forget to button up because they no longer care how people think about them. And they'll say, in some ways they've been knocked down to a lower level of being, but that's good. That's better than what they were. Mm -hmm. So the, my point to this is, when you have a system of evaluating the merits of a therapy, if you devalue those, the humanity of the people from the beginning, it's a perilous path to go down. And you do see that with great um, regularity as sort of a theme in psychiatry. And then, of course, the final thing is psychiatry always has had its foot in one foot in social control. I mean, that's true. And, you know, we have a new Murphy bill. You all following this? Mm -hmm. There's a new Murphy bill that's going to overhaul, uh, it's by, presented by a um, representative from Pennsylvania, and it's going to overhaul the mental health system. And one of the things it's going to do is increase uh, funds for a court-ordered outpatient treatment. 
So I mean, that clearly has a social, you know what I mean, where you have to take your antipsychotics, you're under court order. I don't know if you have it in Vermont or not. It's in most you states. Do. You do. There's no freedom in it. You no, know, the court says if you want to stay out, you've got to take your antipsychotics. The point is that clearly has a social control. So that's another uh, element you see in psychiatry's history. And it really goes back to this fundamental thing of does psychiatry serve the person or does it serve society? And then and you also got to say, how are you valuing those people? Well, ultimately, it hurts both. <clears throat> of course. Of course. With the science that you've been discussing, I'm baffled how then we have uh, laws mandating people take the medication that it's been proven to create the chemical imbalance. I mean, and, and children, you know, it's too disturbing to even think about. So I, it's like cigarettes, you know, we have the warning, you know, and cigarette companies got sued, so I guess I don't understand. How is this? Well, I actually just wrote something on this. I don't believe we would have outpatient mandated court order treatment if we had a clear public understanding of how the drugs affect mm -hmm. Those laws arise because of the, the, the popular narrative, the, the progressive narrative, that these are effective uh, medications for a known disease. And not taking it, the only reason you don't want to take it is because you lack insight. Mm -hmm. And so that narrative is what the one that the public mm -hmm. understands. These people need it, they have a chemical imbalance. It's like, you know, it's, it, it is like, well, aren't we just giving insulin to a diabetic? The problem mm -hmm. is this narrative is not known, and it doesn't drive our, our policy. You know, one quick thing, there was a study in Australia that basically they're going to have an experimental form of care. And in the experimental group, we're going to give them extra support to make sure that we increase medication compliance, okay? Others going to standard of care. And the idea is that medication compliance will lead to better outcomes, okay? Because that's operating within that. So what they find, yes, they got better compliance. <laughs> As they got better compliance, they got a worsening of, 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 of function, in unemployment rates, etc. And actually, that one was such a stunning thing for Australia. They're going like, oh, well, maybe we got a problem. Mm -hmm. But the public doesn't know that. That's not the, mm -hmm. the discussion that drives everything. Laws, etc. Uh, well, let's go here and here. Well, here, here, here what there. methodologies are you observing that don't elicit this compensatory mechanism in the brain? Well, non-drug me me methodologies would. Right? I mean, you, you, you wouldn't have psycho, yeah, psychosocial methodologies, wouldn't <laughs> Literally, it seems to be a universal with the drugs. The only thing I don't know if it's that on a very low dose if you're getting it. So, but it just seems to be, it's, it's, it's built into the brain that when you, it, there's a paper by Stephen Hyman, if you want to really read this. Stephen Hyman's the former director of the NIMH. He's a neuroscientist and he's, uh, was the provost of Harvard. In 1996, he wrote a, a paper called The Paradigm for Understanding Psychotropic Drugs. Mm -hmm. And he says this, all these drugs work, or all these drugs perturb uh, neurotransmitter systems. And he says, in response to that perturbation, the brain undergoes these compensatory adaptations. Mm -hmm. And he says, at the end of this adaptive process, the brain is operating in a manner that is both <clears throat> quantitatively and qualitatively different than normal. And what he says is this, when the drug is an addictive, illegal drug, that tends to have a bad outcome, mm -hmm. that adaptive process. <coughs> but with these prescription drugs, for some reason, that adaptive process leads to a good end. That becomes a therapeutic change. But the process is the same. So that's really the, the problem is the brain is really this unbelievably neuroplastic organ. And it, it, it basically fights against the presence of the drug. Both here, here, and here. Uh, I just want, I'm really happy to be here. I um, read your book when it first came out, and my friend who insisted I read it, um, <coughs> his son had recently been uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia at the time in his 20s, and she was, she's a really powerful woman who believes in a lot of alternative treatments, but found herself giving a lot of like, anything she could do for him. And um, he, he ended his life last year. He hung himself because he could remember himself, you know, but never get back there. But ironically, she, I talked to her last week, 
said there's now some new drug out and she wishes she had known about it because maybe that would have helped him. You know, and this is just like the really deep soulful level of people dealing with it with loved ones where even if they personally don't believe in drugs, it's hard to look at that five to six year outcome when you have someone you love who's sure. you know, having all these symptoms. Right. You know, and she really tried everything and um I just want to point out you know, really, someone who's not, doesn't even believe in this, is still doubting, should I have done something different? So I just want to say that part, because that's, no, that's the really human good. part, no, right? No, it's that really important. You know, <laughs> deeply, you know, yeah. what do we do? Because when you're saying, you know, if led to run its course, what people the, can, not let's yeah. run its course, but people can regain right. equilibrium, but I work at a local psychiatric hospital with adolescents, and, um, they're put on antipsychotic drugs, you know, within days of admission, you know, at 16, 17 years old. Um, and I, I think that's what they say. And, mm -hmm. and because these families don't say, well, we'll see what happens in right. three or four years. You know, they're like, they just got kicked out of school, they were arrested. Right. Anyway, I really respect your work, and I'm also going, wow, what, how, because our culture is not set up to take care of anyone. Right? So, not, so she's raising the exact question that's really the next question. This is a starting point. This thing. Mm -hmm. And it's really an intellectual starting point. So mm -hmm. It's like saying, okay, what is science telling us? But science isn't telling us that it's easy. And it's not really just letting its course. It's actually, it says it, it's take, it, it takes a commitment larger than the family to build, like, systems that really provide safety, mm. stay with people, invest in those people. It's not just, so it's, it's so hard to do that. So if you're a family member trying to do it in a community that doesn't support you, that says you're doing that wrong, there's no support for you. And, and it, not only that is you're fighting against the stream. Mm. The question is, like in, in that area of Finland, that's, it's not that there's an alternative that that's what they do, that's what they do. And so now they have all these resources to support families. And so, for example, one of the things they do in their therapy is, at some point, they bring in employers into the family therapy situations mm -hmm. because they want employers so there's a bridge to getting jobs. And they, you know, they also have to, like, getting people back in school. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, let's just throw the drugs out and everything will be okay. Mm -hmm. It's like, let's build a new system that supports families, make some use of the drugs, figure that out, but really build up a holistic system. But it has, to have a, it has to have a way to support families, keep people safe, all those things. And it's not going to be easy. It just, it's, it's like seeing a possibility. And can I yeah. quickly add, and, yeah, feel, but really, we really have to help young people not do drugs. Like you were saying, drugs can induce this. Out of 20 kids we have right now, we have three <coughs> with full-blown psychosis who were functioning high, you know, on their sports teams in high school and stuff, and started doing some drugs. There's really strong drugs out there. And um, kids, once they, once they enter the system, their life has totally altered course. And that's a real high, I mean, this is just a whole thing. I think it's a really high statistic. Um, anyway. May I suggest so. that um, if you haven't already seen The War on Drugs, which is a documentary about how we are treating our children with drugs. Um. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to everybody. I'm going to go back. I seem to like I've been ignoring this side. <laughs> okay, you well, I just want to say I'm Robert Stack. I'm a licensed mental health counselor. Thank you again. I want to say that, you know, our, we have a governor that has committed to a single-payer system. And most of the discussion is about how to pay for it, how to raise the money, how to switch. Mm -hmm. But really, we should be very actively involved in saying that not only are we going to change the way that we fund this, but we're going to change the way we provide mental health to Vermonters. I mean, it, we, there's always this problem about changing the system the way it was currently set up. And insurance companies will tell you they had quarterly earnings and they had all that stuff and they couldn't take the long-term view. But if we're going to change the way we fund mental health in, America, in Vermont and we're going to tax everybody, we're going to tax business, individuals, we should really come up with a better idea to how to provide that services. And, and you know, it might be that we need to invest 
a lot of money at the front end so that we pay less money later on. And if you have a schizophrenic patient at 18, over his lifetime as a chronic mental ill patient, you'll spend a million dollars. Pick a number, pick a big number, a lot of zeros. And, and, and that person is on food stamps. We need to understand that, and if, uh, I'll stop, I know I'm making this political, but this is a golden opportunity. If we go to single payer system, I think we will be, that we demand that the mental health dollar be spent in a way that is beneficial to Vermonters long term, not short term. I mean, it, 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 I, I hope that makes sense to you, and I hope you can sort of be part of that process. You know, I support single payer, but it's very important that we get addiction and mental health right. Stop treating episodic, chronic, we pay thousands of dollars for 10 days, instead of treating people when they need them long term over a period of life. And I mean quality of life. I don't mean just buying them meds. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about housing and all the other things, social systems, that will help people to get better. And I, I really think this is a golden opportunity mm -hmm. in Vermont, in our little state, that we could actually do this right. We could actually provide mental health over a long term, a beneficial investment and long term positive results. And if there's any place that can do it, it's us. Mm -hmm. We can do it. I also believe, however, that we should look to other states for examples. Mm -hmm. And we should stop being so full of ourselves and start <laughs> looking into <laughs> other systems of care. <laughs> All right. Robert? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, hold on. I'm just going to back, back and forth. And we're going to get it. Okay, go ahead. So um, you mentioned that one of the reasons there's an increase in bipolar is marijuana. And I was wondering if on the hoping for good news front, you had any information about if people stop using marijuana, if symptoms abate or reverse, or if once you're bipolar, <coughs> you're going to be riding the train no matter what that happens in terms of continued or not continued marijuana. Mm -hmm. I don't know the data on that. Because that's I haven't been able to find data on that either. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know the data. It's a darn good question. I don't know the data. I will, know, I, I will tell you one small uh, thing that's not exactly related to this, mm -hmm. but if you look at Fred Goodwin, he's like a uh, former director of the NIH and Mr. Bipolar in the country, mm -hmm. he says that if you look at SSRI-induced mania, you know, so that leads to bipolar, mm -hmm. you often still have the mood instability even after the offending antidepressant is removed. Mm -hmm. And he has some line that you know, once you iatrogenically create a patient, it's no simple matter just, matter just to remove the antidepressant. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that, uh, I don't know how marijuana fits into that. Mm -hmm. okay. But it's, it's a great question. In the back here. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, here and then there. And then we'll, we'll make it, and then no room. Thank you, Robert. Uh, there are alternatives, and there are alternatives in other states. And our neighbor to the south in western Massachusetts, we have something called the Western Massachusetts Recovery Learning Community, mm -hmm. and which operates under the radical notion that human relationships are at the source of what heals people from all kinds of experiences that get diagnosed as whatever. And it sounds like there are people in this room who are doing similar work in this area, but the idea is that people with similar experiences can come together, share their experiences with one another, be understood, be heard, share what has worked with them, what has worked for them, what hasn't worked for them, and uh, along with, um, you know, along with uh, judicious use of <coughs> pharmaceuticals, it can, it makes a tremendous difference for people who have uh, spent years and years in hospitals and are no longer in hospitals, but uh, people who are now out there helping other people. Um, hi, um, I had a few questions. Um, uh, first and foremost, the study done on the decrease in volume. I believe I looked at that, um, and I think she also um, put that in a developmental framework. Like there was a time period, I, I think it was um, starting to see a decrease in the growth um, early adolescence, and that being a predictor, you know, as a risk factor for schizophrenia. Um, I'm just wondering, um, in terms, since we're talking about neuroplasticity, I'm wondering, A, if any more research is going on, especially with that paradigm, looking at it as a disease of the, of the brain, like we would with Alzheimer's. Is that research continuing? 
and um, secondly, I just have to put in um, that um, the, the brain does not um, stop fully maturing until, you know, 25 at least. And in fact, you know, you could have brain damage, uh, be a stroke patient that have brain damage and grow new areas of the brain and have use of an arm that you haven't used for 10 years. So I think, um, you know, leave it to your imagination and what we can do and how our brains can heal themselves. I, I think we're just beginning to understand that, especially, you know, you know, with pot and um, kids who wind up having psychotic breaks. If your kid's under 25, I'm guessing, I'm imagining, and I know there's some studies that suggest, especially with bipolar disease, that given the right environment, it can, your kid can, in fact, recover. Sure. So just, um, anyhow, I just want to know if there's any more research going on with that specific. Research going on? I'm sorry. Related I, to the volume, the loss of volume. Oh, in right. the pre, I think it was the prefrontal yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. um, cortex. And also, I just I saw this amazing TED Talk where the um, um, presenter basically said, we need to stop talking and about um, mental illness as a mental illness, especially with schizophrenia when it, in fact, is probably a degenerative disease of the brain, and so we're not making this about someone's, bad, you know, um, incorrect thinking or incorrect. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like sure. a shift, a paradigm yeah. shift in our way of viewing. Well, yeah. So it's not about the person. It's a, it's you know, it's, it's schizophrenia. It's a right. So asking about the neurodegenerative part. Yeah. So, so this research is quite complicated. <laughs> so, is there research showing that the medications can decrease brain volumes? Yes. Is there research that seeming, and there's a recent one that says that looked at 43 first episode studies mm -hmm. and said the more drug you're giving, the more you see this. Um, there are studies that say it shows up though even before you're on, but there's some, in other words, that yes. there's some, maybe some shrinkage. Mm -hmm before you're put on drug, and then the drug mm -hmm. would be seen as exacerbating that. Mm -hmm. However, there's a group of two researchers named Jonathan Leo and Joanne Moncrief who really looked at that literature mm -hmm. really closely. And they somehow managed to find three MRI studies, long-term studies where people, in fact, really were medication naive for long periods of time, mm -hmm. schizophrenic patients. Mm -hmm. And in those three studies, they did not find significant differences in volumes between the patients mm -hmm. and sort of the controls. Mm -hmm. <coughs> leading to the possibility that it's entirely uh, drug caused. Uh, uh, another problem that we have with this whole thing is um, there is no single thing called schizophrenia. There's no discrete thing called schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a term that is being used to describe a lot of different symptoms. Mm -hmm. All researchers are saying that it's really we should be calling a group of schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And that means that when you see this data that says, oh, schizophrenia is like this, mm -hmm. is whatever, that's just a composite of all these different people. And often that composite is confounded by the fact that they've been on medications. Mm -hmm. So I believe that sometimes there is something just that there is something pathologically wrong, okay? That there's some whatever it might be, wiring, whatever you want to describe it. Mm -hmm. as. That clearly that may be happening to some people. Mm. Other people, it may be so associated with trauma, mm -hmm. okay? Now, trauma will change the brain, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of stress responses and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so, there is plenty of research that is still trying to identify sort of pathologies that could then be treated. Mm -hmm. The problem with that research, in my point of view, is A, we've been doing that for 100 years and it hasn't panned out. So maybe we should be putting our money in psychosocial care. Um, second of all, it is stigmatizing, actually. Mm -hmm. The more you get the broken brain idea, and the more the broken brain idea is, is, is popularized in the public, the more mm -hmm. the public is afraid of people. So you think that the, you know, the chemical imbalance story, you know, mm -hmm. it, 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 it eliminates a sense of responsibility for that person, right? It's not their fault. Mm -hmm. The problem is that actually makes people think, oh, they're defective. Mm -hmm. So it actually increases stigma. Mm -hmm. So what I think history is telling us profoundly is this. We need to conceive of all of us, not those people who have mental illness, mm -hmm. these people who are, quote, normal. We just have to reconceive human beings struggle with their minds. Mm -hmm. okay? 
we all can struggle with our minds. And you know, given what if trauma happens, you know, you start start sleeping, you do some drugs, who knows what? Or maybe you do have some sort of like, um, you know, trauma at birth. Who knows? But human beings struggle with their minds, and I'm I'm pretty sure that we are environmentally responsive. By that I mean when environments go to you know, when you're bullied or when you lose your job, when all those sort of things, stress comes with it. So reconceptualize this as, a, as an us, mm -hmm. not as an us them. Mm -hmm. And then once you reconceptualize everybody as an us, we can start with what do we all need to be well? Mm -hmm. we, right? we need meaning, we need friend, at dinner we do need someone to love, we need someone to love us. Mm -hmm. It really helps to have sleep and good food that sort of thing. And start as that as the central point of our response of mm -hmm. what you were talking about. And then we can think about how the drugs can be a complement to that, whatever. But that's what I think we need to redo. And actually, I think mm -hmm. trying to just focus on identifying the pathology, it really hasn't taken us anywhere. And if you want to have some of that research, fine. But don't make it the focus. It really hasn't mm -hmm. panned out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I have a comment and a question if that's okay. Um, one, for those who are interested in trying to initiate some of this change or apply some of this information in Vermont, there's a, we have a Facebook group, Mad in Vermont, for kind of organizing those types of things. And maybe to be aware, there's a Senate bill, and there's a bill in Vermont right now, 287, about expediting forced drugging and some other things. Um, my question is, um, often when I talk to people about some of your research, uh, what I often hear back is, well, but the brain imaging studies, like, you know, the, the places in the brain lighting up. And my response to that is pretty much simply just philosophical and kind of some of the concerns there. Um, I didn't know if you had anything to, to say about that from a more scientific side. Sure. First of all, those are composites, okay? Doesn't mean that's a, that's that is a, an example of every quote schizophrenic brain. Mm -hmm. Those are composite things that they've done. They've taken scans of a bunch of different people. That's one. Mm -hmm. Two, I'm not sure what it means. Mm -hmm. Three, they're usually done in scans with people who've been on meds. Mm -hmm. And four, okay, let's say they do light up differently. Yeah. Fine. You still have to ask whether the medications help, mm -hmm. regardless of whether they're lighting up differently or if they're working differently. And you know what? The other thing is, you know, the psychotic, if someone is having psychotic symptoms, I would expect the brain to be lighting up differently. Mm -hmm. Someone's depressed, I'd expect it to be lighting up differently. Mm -hmm. If you're happy, lighting up differently. But it's not like that lighting up thing is a, is a uh, you know, persistent state. You know, my brain will be different now than it will be in an hour, and it'll be different, you know, later tonight. So I'm not really sure what that's telling us. But if they get trotted out like, see, mm -hmm. it's a disease. Well, it's just, it's, got a good graph. it's a composite state, fine, I don't know what it's telling us. But the biggest thing is, you still have to ask whether the treatment helps this group of people, regardless of what, it, what those means, those scans are. Um, two questions. When you were talking about the system in Finland, the new system of care... In northern Finland, it's, northern not, it's Finland? not throughout the country, yeah. Okay, northern Finland. Um, did you say something like they were... They drastically cut back on the meds, but they were still using something to help people regulate sleep? Yes. Okay. So what they do early on, so they do try to avoid exposure to antipsychotics. Mm -hmm. But they really think restoring sleep-wake is really important. Mm -hmm. okay. And so if a person hasn't been sleeping, often they will prescribe a benzodiazepine shortly, or some other sleeping aid to help people sleep. Because mm -hmm. as you know, if you, if, if you can't sleep, it really gets desperate. Mm -hmm. it so it, sh it shows that they're not, uh, it's not an anti-med thing. Yeah. It's, we have this toolkit out here, how do we put it to use? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then my second question is, did you see anything in your um, searching and research about um, nutritional or herbal remedies mm -hmm. that were seeming to help at all? Um, so in the, in, the, in the last part of the book, I did look for solutions. I didn't really get into any verbal stuff or anything like that. I'm pretty sure that the larger story of is good diet helpful? I'm pretty sure that is. <laughs> and that can come in a lot of forms. There is a group I know that out of uh, University of Calgary that is doing a lot of research on nutrients and 
so on as a treatment for bipolar, a treatment for things, and they're actually reporting pretty good results. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the problem is, what's that? You are molecular? Yeah, it's, it's like they have some connection. Here's the important thing for me on this. So I, I write a book that's taking a sort of really clear-eyed view about what the research says about the medications. Before I would in any way embrace herbal supplements, you'd want to sort of say, well, what does the science tell about them? And, and I don't know if the science has been done. Uh, I don't know that science. Uh, all I can say is if, if, it, it, if it fits into a larger story about good diet and, and, and a healthy body, I'm, I'm pretty sure that being physically healthy and eating well is pretty good for your mental state. Yeah, that's part of that. Over here. Everybody done over here? Okay. Back here. Here. Well, wait, you, well, I'm going to get the person in the back. Yes. You know, he said that Sandy Steingard is in Burlington, but here in this area of Vermont, is there any alternative for someone who is psychotic and probably, you know, the thing is uh, that they face being medicated and taken to the retreat and put on medications. Is there any kind of something around here? And if, how could I go about trying to find this besides just trying to talk well, to people? There is a house. What's the name of the house that opened? What? Alyssa? Well, there's a it's, a it's a two bed respite house for uh, any Vermonter can go for up to two weeks in a state of mental crisis and it's uh, paid for by the state of Vermont. There's also another house that opened up. What is it called? Hilltop House. Hilltop House. Hilltop house. But, but they do medicate. They do medicate. But they're also willing to put the people up, aren't they? Yes. No. Hilltop is for young adults also. Alyssa is for people of any age. Well, so, I know Hilltop does a lot of medication. Okay, so I don't, I guess I'm wrong. Yeah. So I, I don't really know the answer. All right. <laughs> but go ahead. Beatrice will talk about what she's trying to do. Um, we're co-sponsored Robert's visit here. Yeah. And um, we are wanting to create locally a place for people who um, are wanting to recover from what I would say traumatic and debilitating life experiences which can be translated into mental health and um, addiction issues with the choice to do it without psychotropic meds. Mm -hmm. okay. We need to raise more money. We want to hopefully start <coughs> in a year from now. But And there's a pad there. If you're interested, please Put your name down okay. and contact information. Thank you. And we can get, tell you more in detail what we'll be doing. Thanks. Right. Thanks. Thank you. Well, how about the last couple? Oh, sorry. Last couple questions. Okay. We'll move back. Just a quick comment about the um, idea of demanding that universal health care in Vermont include a different approach to mental health care. That what legislators and the governors need to hear is a large number of different people all saying that one person saying it a bunch of different ways doc, does not work. It needs mm -hmm. to be said by many people to the legislators and the governor. So if everybody speaks up and says one sentence, that's much more powerful than one person saying a paragraph. Okay, last question. I just wanted to get the name of the author that had the study out this week. Oh, it's Martin Harrow. Okay, it's in psychological medicine, and if you go on, I run a website called madinamerica.com. You can see the You can actually download the article there. Yeah. Right, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.